What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Hippie Speedball Podcast. It is Joe, your host with the most Joe. And once again, we are bumping over here in the Zoom room. If you're just tuning in on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button, notification bell, so that way you can get known whenever we got, you know, a new video coming out. So today on the show, I got a really, really awesome guest. He reached out to me. He's got an amazing story. He's been like making waves for years in the medicinal cannabis industry, which as everybody knows from the Hippie Speedball podcast, we love, love, love to pay homage to the medical cannabis side, because if it wasn't for the medicinal side, we wouldn't be where we are right now for Rex. So you got to mind your P's and Q's, show some love. And today on the show, I got Mark Pedersen joining me, who's like I said, got a hell of a story. Mark, thanks a lot for taking the time. I really appreciate you sitting down with me man i will thank you very much i appreciate you giving me the opportunity to be with y'all yeah for sure definitely so uh well before we like while we're getting jump into this let's go ahead and get people a background of who you are uh let's talk about maybe the cannabis patients network and how you got started in uh medical cannabis and your history behind you know your your history with weed <laughs> well i'll try to be keep it as brief as possible because oh no don't worry about that man <laughs> <laughs> You're That's totally cool. By the way, I've I've uh, I have been a patient for over 23 years now, I guess something like that. Uh, my involvement with cannabis goes much further back than that, I guess. Since I was first time I used cannabis, I was 16. Nice. And I used cannabis uh, through high school and and through college, and then I quit for 18 years. And uh, I came back to cannabis only by accident, basically because. Uh, I became chronically ill and uh, I couldn't find relief for my symptoms and I saw a little blip on a fibromyalgia news group that said that cannabis could be good for treating pain, uh, particularly fibromyalgia pain. And I thought, well, what do I have to lose? And I, so I hit up a friend of mine for some very, very poor quality cannabis <laughs> and uh, I uh, started using it. and. Uh, found it quite miraculous because it uh, not only helped me with the pain, the fibromyalgia pain, which uh, anyone who suffers from fibromyalgia knows it's a type of pain that most uh, pain medications just don't touch, but it also helped with severe migraines that I had, which was also part of my disability. Mm. Uh, at one point, I even lost my center vision. Uh, mm. It uh, very scary, very scary. I bet. Uh, but, uh, I started using cannabis and found that uh, uh, the pain subsided, the migraines became almost non-existent, but um, probably one of the most important things was it returned much of my memory, my short-term and long-term memory. Wow. And uh, as I've told people so many times through the years, you don't realize uh, what you've lost in memory unless you have that rare opportunity to regain it, mm -hmm. and which I did. So it was uh, quite amazing. And basically that led to involvement uh, in 2006. I was on Journey for Justice 7, which was a cross country trip, went from Charleston, South Carolina to San Francisco. And I was, uh, I was the uh, on-road uh, coordinator. I drove a support truck with three guys on bicycles. And the whole event was to bring awareness to medical cannabis. And uh, so uh, I got to see the whole country at uh, roughly about 17 miles an hour. And uh, <laughs> lived out of a tent for four and a half months uh, with, with some people who were considerably younger than me, you know. Yeah. <laughs> nice. It was pretty amazing. But uh, that, that pretty much that got me started doing patient interviews. I was amazed. Uh, how many people would come to us and see the banners on our trucks and stuff and come up and want to tell us their story. And so I started uh, cataloging their stories and it was amazing. It, just about every kind of illness that you could imagine, uh, both chronic and terminal illnesses. I did interviews and picnic tables in parks and on the uh, tailgate of my, my truck, mm -hmm. uh, hotels, you name it, just about anywhere, uh, corridors and hotels. Uh, that great anywhere. run and gun style. Yeah. <laughs> That's did, awesome. How, however we had to do it, we did, did interviews. That led, led to more involved, more and more involvement in, in cannabis. And uh, I, I became involved in writing legislation, beginning here in Missouri. And uh, I rewrote the house, uh, house bill for the state of Missouri twice. 
before realizing that uh, trying to work through the state uh, through state lawmakers was next to impossible to get up to bring about anything real. And so uh, the state of Missouri is one of only 16 states in the country that can do a direct initiative. And so I set about doing uh, initiatives that was in 2011. And um, I've written now I've I believe I'm on my fifth full legalization initiative now. Wow, I've, man. I've written for Missouri. I've also written uh, initiatives for Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Nebraska. Uh, haven't got any takers on those yet. I'm still hoping. The uh, Though I guess I, I guess I am winning because I do have virtually all the neighboring states here and across the country uh, plagiarizing my work. So uh, I don't mind. Seriously, oh, yeah. I don't mind. <laughs> I, my goal in all this has always been to bring about real legalization. I want to see cannabis as legal as any agricultural crop. Yeah, that, that is a really, really good, yeah, real legalization. That's a really good, I was going to ask you kind of to dive a little bit more into that, but what you mean by real legalization. So what holes do you see like in the current legalized market right now that kind of really need to be fixed? Well, first and foremost, the very first, uh, my, my initiative is called Cannabis Restoration. Uh, the very first, there's only like nine points in my initiative. One thing I learned, uh, actually, partly from talking with uh, the late great Jack Air, uh, who he, he was uh, he was a primary stimulus behind me writing this initiative. It was through a meeting that I actually had with him in 2006 when wow. I was in California, and uh, he. How was that me. to meet Jack Herrera? Like, oh, I mean, phenomenal! I I I got to sit and just chat with him. <sighs> And while we smoked Jack Hair, that was so <laughs> cool. That is so cool. Jack Hair with Jack Hair. Yeah. I was gonna say that's like that's like that's like the ultimate right there. I mean, <laughs> yeah. that's that's like going back in time and smoking Kush in the Hindu mountains. You know, like that's like the only way to probably beat that. That is awesome. Sorry, go ahead, continue. Well, but seriously though, what he impressed on me was his original legalization bill. And uh, which I did use as, as the beginning for, for my writing when I, I, I was writing. And I, I realized that, uh, you know, cannabis is non toxic. And, and not only is it non toxic, it's highly nutritious. And uh, as uh, uh, Hippocrates said long ago, he said, let your food be your medicine and your medicine be your food. There could not be a truer statement. And exactly. Cannabis nourishes our bodies actually nourishes our endogenous endocannabinoid system mm -hmm. which touches on virtually every aspect of our bodies and our healing and uh, since since my involvement with it i've had the opportunity to I, well i followed a man for three years with terminal melanoma and actually watched cannabis oil applied topically to the to the uh, tumors and killing them and I photographed that, and that's in one of my earlier articles that I've written. I've, that's uh, crazy. I have I have uh, worked with uh, people with lung cancer. Uh, a good friend of mine in Col in Denver, uh, important actually, who has uh, uh, a basal cell and and uh, squamous cell uh, skin cancers. And uh, for a time, we actually saw his his skin cancer stop and heal. I mean, man had suffered with it most of his, his life. Um, the only things that's, that have uh, interrupted that was when, you know, when in 2016 I was uh, busted. I was arrested in Colorado for providing cannabis to five terminally, chronically and terminally ill uh, patients free of charge. And uh, that pretty much stopped me from helping him and it actually cost the life of a lung cancer patient who I was also working with. Oh man, I'm sorry about that. The I've worked the youngest I've worked with is uh, eight months, and that child was one of the children I was working with. Fortunately, he is still alive. He lives in Joplin, mm. and he is now three or four years old now. Three years old. Wow. And uh, um, it uh, it's uh, it, I've I've stopped pediatric seizures in my living room in three minutes when no no pharmaceutical on the market could uh, the uh, pa the parents of the child had a choice either bring the child to me or take the child to the emergency room where the child would be have IVs put in his arms mm -hmm. he's only two and a half years old and um, 
Um, Most likely sedated as well because it'll go into another seizure. Anesthetic, uh, general anesthetic was the only way to stop his seizures. Mm. And uh, he would be spending about three, four days in a hospital with bright lights, all of the anxiety and stress that goes along with it and discomfort. And it's very painful too, of course. Instead, after three, uh, after about five minutes, he was sitting on the floor playing. That's and, insane. Uh, it's, I've seen videos of that happening. And it's like, it's like a miracle, you know, like you, you see them go into these seizures and then you just see the parent rub some, you know, RSO on their gums or, you know, however they need to give them the medicine. And then within minutes, you just see it slowly. You can just watch their eyes coming back on. I have a friend of mine who uh, has a special needs son who actually has seizures on the regular. And right now he is starting to approach the idea of starting to introduce cannabis you know because he's he's, he's like looked into cbd and everything and uh but he's really wanting to like you know use a more concentrated form like an rso or something so for someone like him that might be you know trying to approach that what sort of advice would you give it to give him to kind of boost his confidence to you know really want to go down that road what what we found is is that there is no problem with with we, they see side effects, symptoms, and they and it scares people. It scares people when they, they see that and they don't realize that in a controlled dose, you can work with children, even small children. And there are ways to get the dosage down to a level that would be comfortable for them. But it's amazing how quickly children, uh, their bodies adapt to cannabis therapies. And... Um, Quite amazing, and uh, as far as the euphoria is concerned, and, and uh, we can actually allow children as well as adults to have a normal life uh, through cannabis therapies. Every child is a bit different, and different types of seizure disorders are different. So it, it it takes a little time working with that, particularly to find the correct dosage and such. But it is possible, and there. Are, there's proof all over this country, all around the world, to the uh, efficacy of cannabis treatments. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and like, okay, but thank you for thank you for saying that. I appreciate that because I know he's going to be tuning in and listening to this episode. So I wanted to be able to get some professional insight on that to be able to kind of get him to uh, you know feel a little bit better about it. You know, because there's a like like you said, there's kind of that stigma around it. So it's a lot harder for for parents to try to so certain parents to really make that decision to you know want to give it a shot and everything. So I really appreciate your insight on that. So if you're if you're comfortable about it, you mentioned it earlier, but I wanted to kind of give people a little bit more insight to the uh, to the whole uh, scenario that went down. Uh, if you wouldn't mind talking about the uh, the Jack Split case and the and the Jack's Law that was uh, created behind everything, uh, would you mind going into the history behind that and kind of how everything went? Uh, you know, just tell us the story behind how all that went down. Certainly. Well, uh, basically, what what transpired was I was living in Colorado Springs at the time, and uh, the um, there were laws being quickly changed. Very, uh, it was being pushed by law enforcement across the state. This is something we're seeing around the nation as well. We just don't have names being put on who it is actually responsible. But law enforcement was on a big push to uh, limit uh, cannabis across the across the state of Colorado, particularly for caregivers in particular, who. <laughs> As a matter of fact, was they were, were said was lost revenue due to caregivers is something they said on a television interview. Uh, actually, they're in Colorado Springs. I can go into that more later on if you choose. But basically, uh, um, I was forced to uh, be there. There in in there in Colorado Springs, they made it illegal to produce cannabis oil and which made it impossible for me to provide oil to the people who I was working with. So I had to put everything I own into storage there in Colorado Springs. And I had a good friend of mine, uh, uh, Stacy Lynn in uh, uh, Lakewood, Colorado, which is up by uh, Denver. And she offered me a room in her basement to come up there where I would be able to continue making oil for the patients who I was working with. And so I did. And so I took this one bedroom down in her basement 
And I continued to make oil for the patients I was working with. And then part of that was for me to work with her son. Her son's name was Jack Split. Jack suffered from uh, 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 dystonia uh, and uh, cerebral palsy. Dystonia was the primary reason why I was working with him. And it's because with dystonia it causes the body to uh, retch very hard. In his case, his body would twist, his uh, one arm would twist back behind his back. He, uh, he was confined to a wheelchair, he couldn't speak, he could only speak through an electronic device. He required 24 hour life support. Uh, he, uh, he had to have an RN present 24 hours a day with him. And uh, so I started working with him and I, what I did was I produced uh, uh, suppositories for him, uh, for cannabis oil suppositories, and uh, he began using those. The very first time I saw a difference with him though was when I first got there and his mother took some of my oil and massaged it into his gums while he was in the midst of, of a, a dystonia episode. And uh, from a distance, I watched as his arm very slowly came out from behind his arm and very slowly came down and rested on his wheelchair. His body relaxed. And I just about fell over when I saw that. I just could not believe it. The difference it made. Uh, cannabis therapy, the difference for him meant that he would be able to go back to school, something he couldn't do. Now that represented a big time, big problem for him going to school because uh, for him to go to school, he had a power wheelchair, he had oxygen, he had an RN and he had all these other supplies went with him everywhere he went. Uh, the problem was is that in, in school, when it came time for him to take his medication, they would have to pack everything up and leave school with that, which meant for him, the rest of the day was shot. He couldn't go back to school. So his mom, Stacy, she got to work on getting a, uh, a bill passed, which later was to become called, uh, be called Jack's Law, and which in, in allowed children who were legal cannabis patients to be able to receive their cannabis uh, doses at school. And uh, then a nurse would take care of that, would work with them to achieve that goal. Not a big deal, but a big deal throughout the state of Colorado because there was a lot of areas wouldn't allow it. They, unfortunately, Colorado's initiatives, both of them, allowed for the, the state legislature to basically do whatever they saw fit with cannabis law within their state. And this is a problem across this country with, with, uh, with uh, 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 cannabis legis legislation is they always, after spending all this effort working to achieve a law and getting law passed so the, so the citizenry within the states could actually have access to their cannabis, then they turn around and turn it right back over to the lawmakers, by and large, all prohibitionists and say, here you go. Now you do whatever you want to with our law. And, and then they see it and then they're just like, oh, well, no, no, we're not doing that. No, I remember this stuff. And then they, yeah, that's, yeah. Well, it's in, in the state of Colorado, since the pack, passage of the recreational bill there, there have been literally hundreds of pages of regulation that have been added. Every month, there's more regulation added. And we, and, and uh, uh, cannabis activists have to be there every month to fight back the legislation being passed by these different people. A lot of it being being endorsed and pushed by law enforcement, and uh, for good reason. It's not because they're trying to protect anyone from anything. It's because cannabis is a huge cash cow for law enforcement. Law enforcement profits over twelve billion dollars every year due to civil forfeiture. I learned about that the hard way. They can take your possessions, your cash, anything you have. They can take your cars, your motorcycle, your boats, your home. They can empty your bank accounts, all without even charging you with the crime. So something has to be done. You know, the, the, there's little question as to why law enforcement would not want uh, real legalization in this country. And it's not to protect the citizenry, it's to protect them, their own 
to their, their, their jobs. Yeah, exactly. To protect the livelihood and the badge and, you know, what, what they're, what they're going for and everything. So you're, uh, so you're living in the basement and you're, uh, applying this medicine and you, uh, you really see it working. And what happened after that? Well, I, I, uh, a good friend of mine came into town and, and I had been working quite a bit and, and I am disabled myself too. So it's been really hard on me. So we, when a friend came into town, we left, went up to SS park for a couple of days. And when I came back, I came back to Jack being very ill. And uh, I didn't know what was going on, what was happening. Well, I found out later there had been some changes in his uh, pharmaceutical medications. And um, more than anything else, some issues with one of the nurses that he had, had been having. Uh, and uh, the next day, um, I am surprised by firemen entering into our home and I didn't know what was going on. And I was in the midst of counseling the person who had flown in from England for me to talk to him about cannabis therapies. He was there seeking help with his father for his father. And uh, I was going through telling him about how I produced the oil and going through all that. When I saw through the corner of my eye, a, a fireman entering our home right away, I rushed in there to see what was happening. And I was met by the by Jack's nurse, who told me that Jack was just abruptly said Jack's dead, which um, at that point everything kind of started getting kind of fuzzy for me. Uh, Jack was like a grandchild for me. I was very close to Jack, and uh, he. Uh, uh, I don't know exactly what happened at that point. I think I followed the fireman back to Jack's room because I had this picture in my mind of Jack rather contorted and laying in his bed and his eyes glazed over. And um, it uh, very quickly, the uh, law enforcement replaced the firemen and then detectives. And I found out only some time later that uh, it had gone out across the state, uh, the police airwaves, that uh, Jack of Jack's law had passed. And so all this law enforcement filled our home. The um, according, and I found out some time later, looking at my the discovery from my case, where I saw actually that uh, law enforcement had interviewed the firemen who had uh, the paramedics who had, had come in, and they said when they entered Jack's room that the the nurse was performing CPR on Jack, and lifted his head and said, "I just had a pulse." Well, the, the paramedics took over and the, the paramedics stated, it's in my discovery, that it was very obvious that Jack was dead and had been dead for three hours. So the nurse was obviously covering for himself and uh, found out that he had left Jack for over an hour, two hours without checking on him. And during that time, he aspirated and drowned on his own body fluids. So um, the police officers who filled our home, they searched everything. When they found out I was Jack's caregiver, they took particular in interest in my living quarters downstairs, which they ransacked, literally upturned everything. Uh, they, they took the... Uh, uh, tincture that was going to become oil, that I was going to produce the oil from. They took everything that I had, uh, even though the equipment that I had and stuff. Um, I found out later they ignored everything that was said and had happened with the nurse and bypassed him and went after me. They uh, built a case calling me a cartel that I that I was organized crime, and so they they went after me with organized crime type uh, charges. I I was facing five felony charges, two with mandatory minimums for a total of 64 years in the state penitentiary. I had never been arrested before, and so that's basically what I was facing. They um, I had about seven thousand dollars in a safe downstairs that. Uh, uh, in my, my bedroom that was from a legal case from what had made me sick, the lead company that had uh, made me ill so many years before, the, the settlement money from that, which basically was my money to get back home to Missouri eventually, 
they took it all. And when I protested it, that's when they went after me to basically put me away. They, that was a death sentence for me. So uh, it was only fortunate that I had a very uh, well-known uh, attorney in the area who took me on as a stray dog case. If it hadn't been for the fact that he did that, I would be in prison right now. So, um, but uh, we were able, once he, the, the uh, courts had all my money, they weren't nearly as interested in me anymore. So they, uh, I was able to take a plea. And, uh, so after my probation, then I came back here to Missouri. Wow, dude, that's a hell of a story. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm really sorry for your loss of Jack. Yeah, I know you guys were definitely really, really close. So I'm really sorry you had to go through all that and everything. And I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm really thankful that in the end, though, I mean, what we that you you were able to protect, you know, your your reputation and yourself and be able to make sure that everything that was, you know, right actually came to the light, you know, because I'm, I'm a big sayer on the podcast that I think that cannabis and karma really go hand in hand with one another, that eventually all that stuff will come to the light and everything. And I'm really, really thankful that you're able to still be here with all of us and share the story. So what's your what's what's your next step now? Like, what what's what do you want to do now? Now that everything is, you know, uh, resolved and you're uh, are you off probation now? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. So now that yeah, it was what, what's your next step right now? What's what's the next thing that you want to do? Well, I was I was very fortunate that I uh, through a job that I uh, I helped start a company many years ago, and uh, some stock was sold in regard to that, and that provided me with the funds to be able to come back here to Missouri, and uh, actually pay off what what I had still had left uh, of my bill to the state of Colorado, and once I paid that off, they. They uh, cut my my probation time short, so I could return here to Missouri. And uh, coming back here, things have changed considerably. I I, I don't uh, counsel ne nearly as many patients as I used to. I've worked with patients in virtually every state in the United States, short of maybe one or two up in New England, and um, a number of other countries. Um, I still counsel people. I've never advertised. Uh, people just seem to come to me. Um, I'm not a doctor. I am a patient who has been down, been through so much of this, and I'm just trying to use what I have learned through all this to help as many people as I possibly can. It was never my intention to start a cannabis uh, dispensary or anything like that. Uh, my goal has always been education to help as many people as I possibly can. In my previous life, I had a ministry, which was a benevolence ministry, which I worked with. I had a food pantry, related services and things that I provided uh, to the poor. And after I got sick, all that went away. And then when I had the opportunity to work with cannabis patients, it was like that was given back to me, that opportunity to help people again. And so I've seen this by and large like a ministry, but uh, that only goes so far whenever our legislation is so terribly lacking. And uh, so it, basically I, I went looking for someone, anyone who might be able to produce the kind of legislation that our state, our nation really needed, and I couldn't find it. What I found was a lot of uh, people who wanted to build cannabis businesses, cultivation facilities and dispensaries, and they sculpted their, their legislation around that purpose. And, by and large, the patient, the cannabis consumer overall was left out of the equation. And so I realized through people like Jack Care that the only thing we really could work for us, for, for the state of Missouri and for our nation is real legalization. Real legalization means the same as legal as any agricultural crop, the same as lettuce or spinach or whatever cannabis should, should be. It's non-toxic. Just the fact that you can experience euphoria from it is not a good enough reason to label it the same as heroin. 
it's not a good enough reason to be anywhere on our drug schedule. Yeah, just because you get euphoria doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be like a crime to have it and be able to grow it as much as you possibly need, like any other agricultural product. Or like, for instance, you know, like it or being able to trade it at like a farmer's market or something like that. Like if we can, I, I've worked in the alcohol industry. And if we can set up distillery stands, I mean, why can't farms advertise their products you know and it should it should be like that that's actually a really good way to put it because most people will just get legalization and then be like okay cool we're good we got what we want without really looking at the different uh depths of the bills and the legislations without realizing like oh wait 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 no that's not right like that's not cool because also they'll throw these things in there that can be a slippery slope just back to maintain absolute control over everything well they're seeing that in colorado right now uh as things uh, caregiving has, for the most part, been done away with in the state of Colorado. You know, and that's where the real shame in all this is. It, it, they are sliding backwards. And, and most every state that has a recreational program, they're seeing the same thing as far as patient rights are disappearing. Mm -hmm. And uh, that shouldn't be. First no. of all, it's removal from the drug scheduling. Complete removal, not just knocking it down from a schedule one to a two or a three or whatever, but complete removal. Uh, remove if you move cannabis to a schedule two, three, four, or five. Uh, basically, then it's under the control of our pharmaceutical uh, our, our, our pharmacies, mm -hmm. and the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, the complete removal from the drug schedule means that cannabis then would be the same as any food, any agricultural food. It doesn't mean that uh, that uh, the work is finished at that point. It still needs to be more. But by and large, what we need in this country is education, real education as far as what cannabis really is. The very fact that cannabis has been food and med medicine to the human race for upwards of 30,000 years. Most don't realize that. Most think that it's something that just suddenly came on the on the scene back in the back in the, the nine, uh, in the twentieth uh, uh, century, and it's just not true. The very first law, and all this stuff is stuff you've probably heard a million times. But the very first law regarding cannabis was one that if you grew anything, you were required by law to grow cannabis because cannabis is so vitally important in so many different ways. See, that I actually did not know. I did not know that actually. That's pretty crazy. So that the very first cannabis law was that they needed to grow cannabis before they actually had prohibition. Yes, absolutely. Can cannabis has been a very vitally important. When we talk about when we talk about today here in the 21st century, when we talk about hemp, people a lot of people think hemp is somehow different from cannabis, but hemp is cannabis. Yeah, for sure. Ten, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, anything cannabis was called hemp all the way back through colonial days, it was all called hemp. That's because it all is hemp. It all, cannabis, cannabis is, and you hear about CBD, CBD is a sativa, it's cannabis. It's all the same thing. You know, it's just different aspects of this really miraculous, remarkable plant that we have that can heal us, it can clothe us, it can house us. It can provide fuel for a vehicle. It can do so many absolutely remarkable things. But cannabis prohibition, even in states that have medical, even in states that have recreational, is still very crippled in what cannabis can be for us all, for our country. Cannabis should be touching every individual throughout this country, not just people who smoke it or use it medicinally, but for so many other different factors and ways, cannabis can be hugely beneficial. But, uh, it, you know, it, I, I, for the last five years, I worked predominantly with late stage cancer patients. As, as some of my colleagues have worked specifically with children and, and uh, uh, seizure disorder and, and others, you know, there, it's so many other different factors, but then you have all these other factors that touch on our lives as well. You know, and like I, like I was talking about from fuels to clothing to so many other different factors under a when cannabis was truly legal truly legal it means that that your hemp crop that you're growing or your cbd crop doesn't have to be tested to make sure it doesn't have too much thc in it anymore mm -hmm. they can grow it the way hemp used to be grown before it was made illegal 
plants that, that were grown for industrial hemp, the THC levels were all over the place on those because the fact is, is that THC is produced by the cannabis plant, not to produce euphoria in humans, but for the benefit of the cannabis plant. The yes. same way our endogenous endocannabinoid system mm -hmm. is for the purpose of keeping our bodies in homeostasis within the phyto or plant-based cannabinoid system is achieving the same goal within the cannabis plant as far as maintaining a good healthy plant homeostasis. It's just that remarkable fact that, that uh, THC, which is in the cannabis plant, so rem is so remarkably similar to uh, uh, anatomite, which we produce endogenously. It's the fact that in your bloodstream, you can't tell the difference between the two. And this is part of the reason why we benefit from this so, so much so. And, uh, you know, I, I, I have my personal preferences in regard to this, mentioning uh, your, your friend, I believe you mentioned before, uh, uh, in, in that regard. I have personally found that within the children that I have worked with, that the THC rich oils have worked most efficiently. Uh, THC rich oils, uh, for the most part, the only ones that seem to be able to pull a child or an adult out of the midst of a seizure. CBD, not so much, though CBD is quite remarkable. It's a very remarkable uh, component of cannabis as well. Yeah. Well, when it comes to, you know, using it as a medicinal purpose, you need a more entourage effect, you know, like that THC plays a huge factor, not just the CBD, the CBN and the CBG and the THCA. And like, there's so many different factors that create the holistic thing to, you know, uh, to, to put a number just on THC to quantify or qualify a plant is just, it makes no sense. And anybody that works in cannabis will tell you that a million times, you know, like you go to any dispensary, they'll be like, Oh, just give me the highest THC. And you'd be like, uh, okay. You know, it's like, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean everything. You know, I've had some, some strains where that was like 32% THC that didn't get me as high as one that was 16% THC. THC. You know, it's like, it, there, it's such an entourage effect. And there's so much more to it that people don't even realize. Well, it's, you know, back in the day, you could take bad or so so cannabis, and just run it in the process of drying it and turn it mostly into CBN. And suddenly you had something that that was a uh, gave you couch lock and everyone said, Wow, this is really great cannabis <laughs> has to do with the way in which you process it can have a lot to do with that. So, yeah. you know, it's, you know, in the same way as in, in the early days of CBD, they would take and nullify the THC, basically scorch the, scorch the concentrate. So it uh, basically it would register a CBN instead of THC. And so suddenly, oh, it's, see, it's all CBD. Mm, you know, gotcha. It, okay. It's a, <laughs> you know, we don't have to, you know, if cannabis is truly legal, really legal, none of these games would be necessary. Anymore. I know, right? We're not talking about like tomatoes this way. We're not talking about like growing spinach this way or anything like that. Yeah. That is funny, the conversations that need to be had just because of the fact that it isn't that way, you know? And, you know, like you said, it's been going on for thousands and thousands of years, you know, like uh, you mentioned that you've worked in like ministry. I have a family that's, uh, I, have, I have some family members that are particularly religious, you know? And I told them all the time, I was like, well, what do you think that burning bush was that Moses was probably talking to, you know? It's like, I know I've, I've burned some bushes in my time and I've talked to God a couple of times, you know, and plus, Hey, that was probably some good Hindu Kush from those mountainous regions. What's to say it wasn't something like that, you know? Well, cannabis was very prevalent in Jesus's day. Oh yeah, it most was, definitely. There. It uh, actually is part of the holy anointing oil mm -hmm. yeah. in the old Testament, which I've had that rare opportunity to experience, which is absolutely remarkable. Wow. What was that like? It, uh, well, you think about salves or lotions, you know, and they had that deep heat effect, you mm -hmm. know, whatever they put into it. The uh, cinnamon and, and all that goes into the holy anointing oil, as well as the cannabis oil, has got its most intense wow. feeling on your skin. I, I had terrible, I was visiting with this gentleman who, who was dying of terminal melanoma. And, uh, uh, his, uh, and I had, my back was hurting really bad and I didn't want to say anything because here, this gentleman was dying such a horrific death. Uh, what I was experiencing meant nothing to him. 
And he sends his wife over to get the holy anointing oil and they put it on my back. And it was just absolutely incredible. The pain was gone. The uh, sensation was, was awesome. Uh, and it's something that the rest of this country should have the right to experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, I want to now, like, that sounds amazing. <laughs> you know, like, I particularly just started using this one soap because I like the way it makes my skin feel all open and good and stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's awesome. And one thing that I wanted to uh, mention something about, like, as you were talking about, you know, like the concentrated versions of cannabis and stuff like that. What is it about concentrates and, you know, about what well, concentrates and edibles and, you know, oils, as opposed to flour, like that makes it a little bit Bit more medicinal is there something that happens in the extraction process that just kind of brings out more of the medicinal properties or what is it it's just well as as the name goes it's a concentrate so it's a constant it's concentrated uh, medicinal components like the cannabinoids and the terpenes and such are, are more concentrated so it means like the percentage of uh, we talk about thc in particular you look at the the percentages of thc in uh in flour can be 12 15. I know there was at one point they were talking to some states putting a ceiling only 16% THC. Well, I've, we've seen it 20%, uh, 25%. Some some people selling us at 25, 30%, whatever. In flour, which is meh, okay. But in concentrate, you can see those numbers shooting up to 50%, 60%, 70% uh, of THC. And, and in other cannabinoids, the concentration can be also very high as well. That's really the difference. And this is where we saw the miracle start beginning. And that was, you know, back about, uh, you know, 2012, 2013, 2014, where we see, uh, like the, with the CBD craze that came about predominantly through concentrates. Uh, you know, the, uh, that, that happened in Colorado Springs and uh, with the Stanley brothers down in Colorado Springs, which they were playing around with uh, some strains of cannabis and was, from what I understood, was looking to shorten the growth cycle, I believe, on the cannabis and bred a, uh, a, um, uh, a strain of, uh, a particular strain of cannabis that was high in CBD, that was high, that had a short growth cycle. And, and uh, what they ended up with was a plant that was really high, wasn't very high in THC. Uh, and that's why the name, I believe, was, uh, um, what was it? Hippie's Disappointment, I believe, was the original. Hippie's Disappointment. <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> that's an awesome well. strain name. <laughs> but, but the remarkable thing came from that, though, was, was a strain that was high in CBD. And in remarkably, what we found is that it was able to, to lessen the number of, of seizures that a child was, was having. So in that, in, in that, that came up with something that, that is quite remarkable. Now there's been many different strains out, out there that are high in CBD as well and uh, provide benefit, not just only in seizure, but in other things as well. But uh, yeah, concentrate is when we saw the miracles begin. This is when we started seeing uh, things like uh, tumor shrinking, which is remarkable the uh, uh, tumors disappearing all together. You know? And this is with people who basically were late stage cancer patients. So they, there was nothing else that they could have taken. They were just, they had already given up and then they were like, all right, well, this is kind of a last ditch resort. And then boom, that's what ended up saving their life. You know, look at uh, Rick Simpson. I mean, like, you know, the, the man that cured his own cancer <laughs> and, and brought us the beautiful Rick Simpson oil. But see, you know, concentrates have been around for a long time, and that's where Rick found out about them. Uh, the very first oil I made, I, I made from an isomizer, which was uh, the patent on it was circa 1978, and uh, the patient who I followed with terminal melanoma, he willed that to me. He said, here, he goes, after I pass, I want you to take this and make oil from it and help other people. And so under my promise to him is why, what I did. I packed it out to Colorado with me because at the time I couldn't legally produce oil here in Missouri. So I took it to Colorado with me and started making oil out there. And uh, it's just what we experienced was just so remarkable on a, on a device that was so old, you know, so. Cannabis concentrates have been with us a very long time.
yeah and they're beautiful and they're starting to really pop up more and more too because i'm up i'm actually i'm up, up, up here in oregon and uh up here in oregon the you know the concentrate game is like really really popping you know it's like def definitely a little bit more concentrates being sold than uh, than flour you know because i still love to smoke flour and everything i just recently started dabbing a little bit more i just got some uh some dr jollies actually some dosty dough from dr jollies over in ben really really good stuff actually yeah they, they have really good stuff up here in oregon and one of the great things about up here is i've noticed that a lot of states like you were talking about how they're not really showing a lot of love to the medicinal side like with the rec game it's kind of it's kind of hurting like the patients and stuff like that i've actually noticed a little bit of a difference up here in oregon we seem to have a lot of patient priority because there's some dispensaries that you go to that if you're in the uh, the oregon medical marijuana program that they'll actually give you first in line like you actually get to go before everybody so i'm glad to see like there's like that there that we're kind of maybe maybe the last ones that are like you know a little bit more of that patient priority and stuff but that's really sad that a lot of states are kind of slipping down that way well it's a uh, the the thing about this is it's just uh, some some bad thinking all the way around uh and the problem the problem is is poorly written recreational bills it's not that recreational is bad or harmful for patients. It's that recreational bills that are poorly written can hurt everyone. Yes, and definitely. This is the problem with this overall. Understand, this is the difference between we have, you have got medicinal, you've got recreational, and then you have real legalization. Real legalization means that patients and adult users all have free access, have, you know, they have they've got legal access. Let me put it that way. And also, more economical access overall as well, because you've taken out much of the overhead that, that those who produce, those who grow it, have to endure. Uh, all the hoops that they have to jump through are gone. Then it's treated the same as any agricultural crop. You wanna keep a good, healthy product for, for patients and adult users, but you want it to be available to everyone. Uh, and, uh, you know, un under my initiative, cannabis would be available in, in a produce section of grocery stores. You would be able to go in the produce section and see it, see and purchase flour. You'd be able to go to the frozen food section and buy edibles and other different components and products, you know, in every, every area throughout the, the grocery store, you'd be able to get it. And the big thing that comes up with that, I've actually outlined five different key components that are required that we need to be thinking about when we think about real legalization for any state. And probably one of the first on that list is what about our children? I hear it all the time because my initiative doesn't have an age, age limit. Right. People say, well, what are, how are we gonna protect our kids? Well, what are you trying to protect your children from, first of all? Yeah. From a non-toxic product? Now, I'm not condoning that young children be smoking pot per se or whatever. But we have something that's actually, a, 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 if, if you uh, allow me to say so, there is a biblical thing that actually addresses this. This is called parental guidance, you know, you know when you're a child. And uh, raise up your children in the way they should go. And when they're adults, right. they will not depart from it. You know that one? Mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, you know, my point in all that is, is that, you know, if for some reason you don't want your child consuming cannabis, then you should, you're the first person who, sh who should be there to address that with your child, to tell yeah. your child about what is your personal belief system and what you want for your family. Like, right? why are you going to punish a whole culture and a whole, like, you know, industry just because you don't know how to parent your child right? You know, it's like you're expecting the world to parent your child for you whenever you should be the one that actually implements what you want them to, what you or what you believe they should or should not do, you know, exactly. and then instead of telling the world to, you know, submit to your own will. And also, it's most of the time because they're uneducated about the whole fact in the first place, too. Bingo. You just hit it right on the head. Parental guidance when you're a child personal accountability when you're grown. You know, and that's what my le the legislation that I've pressed has all been about. You know, if, if uh, you know, in, in my, my initiative there, you cannot charge someone for, with a DUI solely on the basis of the fact that they look like someone who consumes cannabis. You can't stop and ticket someone based on the fact that you think you smell cannabis 
What crime were they committing? Can you pull them over? That's my point in all this. What is the, what is the actual crime? You know, and if there is a crime being committed, deal with the crime. Don't be, don't be going after people because of your personal prejudices. Yeah, or preconceived notions that you might have of like who this person is, you know, which is obviously, as we're seeing in our world today, is a giant problem, especially when it comes to law enforcement. Absolutely. It sounds like I'm really hammering on law enforcement. That's usually when I, we, we, you hear somebody say, well, you don't punish everyone because of a few bad apples. But the fact is, is it's not a few bad apples we're dealing with when it comes to law enforcement. It's bad pro policies, bad yeah. programs that even the good cops are forced to have to adhere to. That's what we're really dealing with. That's where you see all the issues of prejudice, not and, and as well as the, the uh, terrible things regarding cannabis. Mm -hmm. that it, with proper legislation, with an initiative like cannabis restoration, it means that law enforcement no longer has to, has to be uh, going after people who use yeah. cannabis. Instead, now they're protecting people who use cannabis. And not only that, they are using it. I've had a number of, of, law, of people in law enforcement uh, who have come to me from Texas, and Ohio, Pennsylvania, a number of different places because of a, one of their loved ones or themselves came down with cancer and they needed help. I've had pastors. I had a pastor uh, from, I think it was Kentucky, sitting in my living room years, years back with, with his uh, head bowed like this as he's talking to me and he says, you know, I used to preach against the use of cancer. He used to tell everyone that it was from the devil. He goes, now I'm here, here seeking your help for my child because my child has cancer, you know. I've talked to a number of, of pastors about that very thing, and they've expressed the exact same words to me. It's like, what was it? Why was it that I was against this? Why? Yeah, and there, well, with that societal pressure, especially on a position like that, you know, it's like you have to make this stance and you have to, you know, do this. And and what's sad is a lot of those people that make these stances and have that sort of view on things, they don't even like to look at research on different perspectives to try to open their eyes because they are so blinded with this certain perception until something like that happens to where they need the help they need the assistance where they're like okay well maybe this is my only option right now maybe this is actually something that i'm not maybe this isn't something that i know everything about so they seek some guidance seek some assistance and when it comes to like you know law enforcement and uh, like civil workers firefighters doesn't matter there's no reason why they shouldn't be allowed to use cannabis you know a lot of them want to be able to use it i mean if you're able to go and put your life on the line and everything like like that there should be no reason why you can't smoke a joint when you get home you know and like for like a, a lot of people don't realize especially with the fire department uh there's actually a big initiative right now that a lot of firefighters are trying to push to be able to use cannabis because with the way their shifts work i mean they only work 24 on and then 48 hours off and so there should be no reason why during those two days that they can't use cannabis when it would have zero effect on them going to work 48 hours later well, what, what we have found too, that with regular use, as opposed to just an occasional recreational use, but with regular daily use, the euphoria dissipates. Yeah, definitely. So I, I consume between 150 and 200 milligrams a day. And uh, this is as high as I get right here. This is yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, you're looking at, yeah, you're pretty much looking at me. I took a couple dabs off of Puffco right before we started, actually. But I've been so ingrained in the conversation, I forgot to even grab it, actually. <laughs> Normally, I'm smoking during this, during the podcast, but I've just been, like, listening the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's that's the thing, is that it's it's a misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. A mis misunderstanding of how cannabis really affects the body. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, is that uh, the more we consume it, the more our body adjusts to it, the more our body see it as food and process it as such. Mm -hmm. And we, we reap the benefits of all that. Well, and so, the more that we, uh, yeah, the more it like it adapts and sees it as food, like you put it, the more it can also see what food it might like better. You know, you can might be like, okay, well, I don't really like that strain, but I really like this strain. You know, I, I, I've talked about this on the podcast. I had a friend of mine who only really, really likes particular sativas. 
And so we found like two strains that he really dug. And then we did like a little like lineage genealogy research and figure out where they might be connected. Come to find out that skunk number one was along the lineage of both of those strains. I was like, okay, well, maybe it's that skunk number one that you like. And, and, and then we were like, boom, found him some skunk number one. That's his favorite strain now. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's exactly right. I mean, that's what we have found. And, that, and it, you know, I've, I've quizzed people through the years, different people about what it is that they consume. And what we have found overall is, is what smells good to you, what you enjoy actually benefits your body the best. Mm -hmm. um, sativas have kind of gotten a bit of a bad rap with medicine that, because what well, we've seen that particularly with concentrates and uh, for the treatment of terminal illness, we gravitated towards the indicas, and predominantly because they have a more narcotic effect, they they they're more uh, uh, sedative uh, effect, and, and help a lot more with hunger pain and stuff. Well, it's 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 beneficial for people who are battling cancer because what they need to rest, right? Yeah, exactly. But, but for someone who's active, uh, sativas, you're more uplifting. Uh, people who are working, they need to use their brains, you yep. know, uh, active during the day. Sativas can be very good for that. And, and uh, so I have in many ways returned back to sativas because that's where you see those nice, uh, fragrant, fruity yeah. smells and flavors. And all the and, lemon. And yeah, <laughs> I have a I have a mimosa that I'm, I'm growing right now that has a very citrusy smell to it. Nice. Wow. I, I love I love when it's got all that freaking citrusy goodness in there and you crack it open and it smells like freaking oh, I love it. I love all this. <laughs> I love those strains. And, and sativas are medicinal, too. This is really important Definitely. to understand that sativas can be very high in the different cannabinoids that we need, just the same as the end of this can be. Well, yeah, and it's medicinal for so many different purposes, you know, because I've noticed that like if I'm if like like if I'm like having insomnia, boom, I'll use like an indica or if I'm having a hard time sleeping. But if I'm dealing with really, really bad depression, I like to use a sativa because it's so euphoric and it also boosts my creativity, like it gives me energy because depression like wastes my energy away. But if I can get a good sativa, it'll perk me right back up. So I'm kind of like I, I kind of like fade towards sativas more lately too but it also kind of depends on what i'm using it for well you know I, i've talked to a lot of veterans dealing with post-traumatic stress i've interviewed veterans on camera from uh, vietnam gulf war iraq and afghanistan uh, and uh, heard their stories uh, and you can see some of the stories on my youtube channel and uh, more will be coming to my my uh my website uh, it's cannabispatientnetwork.com and, and with cannabispatientnetwork.org, you can see some of my interviews that gets on my YouTube channel. I think it still does. Which I'll put a link for right in the description down below for the people that want to check that out. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Uh, eventually, my all my, interv my, my video interviews will be available from my website as well. And uh, we're, the, um, it's just taking time getting everything up. Uh, actually, we have a new website too, which is uh, reallegalizationmo.com, which it, it just came on board this past week. And uh, working with a good friend of mine, Ben Hartley, who is uh, kind of heading that up and uh, working with us on the, our, our legalization uh, project here in Missouri. And uh, we're also advising some of the neighboring states as well. but. Uh, my hope is to see real legalization come to this uh, to at least one state. If we get to at least one state in the country, it will be very quickly spread throughout the rest of the country. Because uh, instead of uh, a, a cannabis program that uh, is worth two, four, five billion dollars, we're looking at a cannabis program that could bring in as much as five hundred billion dollars. That's what the difference of real legalization, because instead of touching on 15, 20% of the population, now you're touching on 95% of the population of our nation. Yeah, definitely. Like, it's I mean, mind -boggling. for sure. I mean, so out of all the different, uh, and all the different like you know legislations and all the different stuff that you've seen throughout all the different states in the United States, which state do you think is closest to real legalization? Oh, I would say Missouri. Missouri? Go oh, Missouri. We, because we actually have a, a real legalization initiative that is in the process of getting ready to start gathering signatures on that again this year. 
Uh, the biggest issue is that we don't have the big money that the recreational ones have. Of course, uh, their money comes from outside contributors who yeah. are to build an industry. My hope is to get the point across to these people who want to build industry to understand that when you take away all of the, the laws and the boundaries and the restrictions, suddenly now may, for, for someone to make money in the cannabis industry could be far easier and much, much, much more profitable. Well, yeah, and it also eliminate all of those, like, you know, like those hundreds of thousands of dollars of starting costs to do anything in the cannabis industry right now, because you could have someone that might have a, an amazing idea that could end up saving hundreds of thousands of lives, but they can't do anything because they don't have the money to start. So having a legislation like that would be the perfect thing for somebody in that position. Uh, years, years back, uh, me and a former business partner and I were working with uh, a dispensary in Peoria, Illinois. And at one point, uh, the, the guy who uh, was uh, uh, owned the dispensary, I was talking to him about real legalization. He asked me, he said, well, how much money do you, would it take for you to bring about real legalization? And I said, in one state, I said, a million dollars. And uh, he goes, and he goes, $10 million. I told him to say $10 million, we can bring legalization to the nation. Yeah, for sure. Mostly because I haven't sought a profit from the work that I'm doing here. My profit is in seeing our nation truly be, be legal across the board, seeing that my children don't have to look over their shoulders if they choose to grow cannabis or consume cannabis or share cannabis with a neighbor or someone else who, who is less fortunate, you know, there, that's where the real profit in all this is. Yeah, that's for sure. Good. And, and all the generations that are going to be, you know, entering into this world and entering into this industry and everything are definitely going to be thanking the people that like yourself, that'll be making these legislations and opening people's eyes to, you know, the ways that there could be total freedom in all of this rather than, you know, strict corporate, legislation and laws and you know all the, the different people that would lock us up in prison are all the same ones telling us what we should and shouldn't do with our medicine and that's not right so it needs to be like total legalization like you were talking about for the generations after so that they i'm sure they'll definitely appreciate that and but opening up people's eyes to this sort of thing i think is a different step that not a lot of people really have thought of before so i'm really really thankful that you're able to come on the podcast and talk about this stuff because it's super important that everybody knows this stuff well, we have to talk about it. That's for sure. This Definitely. is the only way people will truly become educated and understand really how, how beneficial it is for us individually, but also benefit, beneficial for our communities, for our state, for our country, for the world. Mm -hmm. I, I, have, I have worked with patients in India. I've worked with patients in the UK, you know, and throughout Europe. Uh, I even had a patient contact me from Dubai. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's it, South Africa and other places, Australia and New Zealand. And I can't name all the different places. But the fact is, is that the need is huge. The need yeah. is not just here in the States. It wraps around the world. Yeah, it's universal. I mean, it's it's everywhere. I mean, uh, yeah, the need is definitely everywhere. And and it sucks because there's so many other countries that are still like, still like super, super hard on their weed laws and their cannabis laws. And you'll still get locked up for 30 years just for having a joint, you know, or just even like a tiny little smidgen of a nug. And uh, I'm hoping that, you know, as more countries are kind of opening their eyes, the other ones that are like that will kind of be like, okay, or maybe we can kind of change things up a little bit. That's the hope. <laughs> That's the hope, right? So before we sign off, one thing that I really want to do, uh, I always I want to get your story from. You mentioned it earlier. I was going to just do it then, but then we got taught up in conversation. Uh, everybody that comes on the show, I like to get their first time they ever got stoned. So you said you were 16 whenever you, uh, the first time you ever smoked. So tell me the story of the first time you ever smoked. Well, I, <laughs> I was sitting in study hall. Okay. Nice. <laughs> Good start school. so far. Sophomore in high school, right? And I'm sitting in the study hall and I see one of the, this kid across the way, across the table from me. And one of the kids from the other side of the tracks, kind of a scenario, you know? 
And uh, I'm, we're, you know, look what we're talking about here. We're talking about, well, you know, 60s, early 70s here, right? And, uh, but uh, he was rolling something back and forth from hand to hand across the table. And, his hand, and I realized right away, it kind of looks like a joint. That looks like a joint. The only other place I'd seen one was on TV, right? <laughs> and uh, I said, what is that? And he just kind of looked at me, kind of funny looking, you know, with kind of a half smile on his face. And I said, is that a joint? He goes, yeah. And I said, can I have it? And he looked at the joint, he looked at me, he looked at the joint, he goes, okay. And he just gives it to me, you know? Nice. And uh, then it's just like, I'm to totally terrified what I got in my hand, you know? And I ended up back at home, you know? and. Uh, uh, there was nobody else at home when I got home and I went out in the backyard and, and I smoked it and coughed and smoked it and coughed and coughed and coughed <laughs> and didn't feel anything, absolutely nothing. There actually was, was uh, quite a few joints after that before I actually got experienced euphoria. Oh, wow. But, uh, it was all I had access to back in the day was Mexican brick and very poor quality Mexican brick. I was going to say, it turns out the kid from the other side of the tracks was growing some garbage ass weed. That sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but the, the thing is, is that it, it sparked my curiosity in it. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, from from there, it, it went on to, you know, uh, things like Colombian and uh, Panama Jack and mm. what were all some of the other old strains from back in the day that we had back then and uh Kai stick oh my goodness uh and all the different things you know and it was you know that was back then you know and and of course that carried on then through college i was an art major in college so it kind of followed suit i was gonna say so it definitely fits you know you're either, like either like the arts and the music people generally it just fits you know like because i'm a musician myself so pot was like uh, everybody thought i smoked weed before i even smoked weed because i mean <laughs> i like when i was like 14 i looked like i stepped off the set of days and confused you know i had like long hair and i was wearing like zeppelin shirts and stuff like that like i was way into classic rock and the blues and everything and then i was 16 when i first started too that's a great first time story did you ever approach the guy uh, and be like yo that joint didn't do anything for me oh you know i don't think so and i have absolutely no idea what ended up happening to him he's probably a, a mayor of some city or something now that's the thing about what we find with a lot of the people who used to be the use the cannabis the most they end up going becoming doctors or attorneys or some kind of something whatever it's because their eyes are open <laughs> so it's pretty amazing but i mean you know that was that was the thing though it's uh uh you know i think about that and i think about you know if i only knew back then what i know now you know mm -hmm. oh my gosh i know you'd be able to like change the world if you could go back in time with the you know what you what you know now and everything like that would be crazy the medical community has known since 1974 that cannabis could kill cancer yep. since 1974 Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always tell people that a lot of people like Oregon uh, was actually the very first state to decriminalize cannabis in the in the United States back in the 70s, because ever since then, they were like, oh, wow, there's something there's something to this, actually. That's right. That's awesome. Well, dude, Mark, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really, really appreciate you taking the time to tell us these amazing stories. And it's it's been a real honor meeting you. I can't wait till we can meet in person someday. Oh, we look forward to that. That'll yes, definitely. We want to do some traveling and get the, you know, some word of mouth for the podcast. And we definitely want to make our way down to Missouri. And so that would be, that would be great to be able to sync up with you and talk more in person and be able to chat. Cause I feel like we could probably talk for hours about this stuff. <laughs> There are so many different facets, so many different, and so many different stories of patients. I've, like I said, I've interviewed probably 300 or so on camera at one point in time or another, but I have thousands of interviews that I've had with different patients and, and so many different different subjects, but predominantly on the efficacy of cannabis. But, I love uh, it. Doctors, scientists and doctors and you name it. I love it. So before we sign off, uh, is there any you want to tell people where they can find you at and uh, the links for your websites again? Absolutely. Well, my website is cannabispatientnetwork.com. Uh, the website for our, the work we're doing with our initiative is uh, reallegalizationmo.com. Reallegalizationmo.com. 
And uh, that's where you can go if you want to make a contribution towards our campaign or if you want to want to see how you can work with us, or perhaps even if, if you want to see uh, how real legalization can fit with your state, wherever you might live. Uh, we'd be happy to work with you. Awesome. Well, dude, Mark, thank you so much again for reaching out and taking the time. I really appreciate you, man. Thank you. I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in to the Hippie Speedball Podcast. It is Joe, your host with the most Joe, and I will see you guys next time. Peace!